Hello there, my name's Patrick Denny and welcome to this talk about George and Colchester. Now you'll see from the the title screen that we're we're actually going to be discussing a number of um, people, individuals, families who lived in Colchester at this time and particularly those who perhaps um, considered themselves to be part of this what was called the genteel class of Colchester, part of the town's social and political elite and we'll also be looking at the houses that these people lived in certainly the the troubles of the previous century you know the 1600s had passed by you know we had the siege of colchester of course in the 1640s and you know 20 years later the the devastating plague which you know decimated half of the town's population but by the end of the century and in the beginning of the 18th century things apparently were appearing to be on the up and um you know there was a recovery taking place at, at least for some people anyway and one particular activity that uh, many of these people were involved with at the time especially those who could afford to do it of course was building themselves new houses new houses made of brick with sash windows in line with the london fashion so let's make a start on our talk and we're going to begin by just having a look at um, one or two comments that were made um, by people and travellers who actually came to Colchester during this period. So the first one I'd, I'd just like to share with you, and this is um, was made by Celia Fines, uh, a well-known travel writer of the period, and she came to Colchester in 1698, and let's see what she had to say. She said, the town looks like a thriving place by the substantial houses, well-pitched streets, which are broad enough for two coaches to go abreast, besides a pitch walk on either side by the houses, secured by stumps of wood, and is convenient for three to walk together. You know, when I, I saw this, and I, I saw that bit about stumps of wood, it, it reminded me of this image. Um, this is believed to be by Edward Eyre, um, circa 1770, and it it's, it's seen looking up Mersey Road from somewhere near where the modern day St Butler's Roundabout is now. But can you see those wooden posts um, on the right and on the left, presumably there to protect the pedestrians, you know, from the traffic, the wheeled traffic that's um, coming up and down. So that's, a, that's something interesting we can get from pictorial sources. Another individual, of course, who came to Colchester was Daniel Defoe. And in 1722, he said, Colchester is well populated, but still suffering from the effects of the Civil War. The town is large, very populous, the streets fair and beautiful, and though it may not be said to be finely built, yet there are an abundance of very good and well built houses in it. And I thought, finally, I'd just add a quote by Philip Morant. Now, although he wasn't writing until 1748, here he's talking about the rebuilding of St. Mary at the Walls Church, you know, between about 1710 and 1714. And he says, in 1714, handsome gravel walks were made all round the church, planted on each side with lime trees. Of course, those lime trees are still there which was shady and pleasant in the summer, and they being the best walks about the whole town, and much resorted to by people of the best fashion. You know, and it's these people of the best fashion, or some of them at least, that we're going to be discussing as we move forward. I'm going to start by showing you a portion from a Philip Morant, um, his history, 1748. And this is a plan which was drawn up by James Dean. James Dean was an architect um, builder at the time, very influential. He did a lot of work for some of these important people. And in, in this plan here, we can see the central part of Colchester over to the west um, or to the left to you as you're looking at it. You can see the Balkan Gateway and the Roman Wall runs all the way around, coming up here and right around here. Now, in total, the, the area encompassed within the town Roman Wall is about 108 acres. And the eastern part of the town, and um, I'm sort of indicating here where the castle is, right from the castle right down to where Roman Road is now, and over on the east side of the wall here, um, 
that accounts for about a third of the actual walled area of Colchester. And in the 18th century, that third was occupied, occupied by just three families. Charles Gray with the castle lands, the Reverend John Halls with Greyfriars, and over on the east, on the south side rather of the high street, George Wegg, um, who had a large estate there. So we're going to begin, if you look to the right hand side of your of this plan, you'll see East Hill and you'll see some little houses indicated here. And we're going to start by walking up East Hill and we're going to look at some of these buildings. We're not going to walk more than about 300 yards, three or 400 yards at the most. And we're only going to be looking during this talk at six buildings. So you can count them off as we get through them. And the first one, Number one is this building here. As you come up East Hill, you'll, you'll see this very impressive looking brick fronted building on your left. It's now known as numbers nine and 10 East Hill. And if you look, it, it goes quite a way back. Now, a lot of this at the back here is modern apartments and, and flats and what have you. But the original house did go back. There was a couple of big bays going up here and here. So it went, went quite large. You'll notice that it's only got the brick front. Like with many Georgian buildings, although they were typically brick built, ideally they were symmetrical and you know, ideally they would be whole brick. Not everyone could afford to completely rebuild in brick. They might have had chimneys in the way and all sorts of um, problems. So what many did, they just put a front on the front of the house to make it more modern. You know, most old buildings that, that um, in the town were old timber frame buildings. And although we probably like timber frame buildings now, uh, to the people in the 18th century, they were yesterday. Nobody wanted those. The, the fashion was for brick fronts, sash windows. If you could afford to rebuild the whole house, all well and good. But in this particular case, they've only got it on the front. And um, it depends which angle you look at this building. If we go over onto the footpath right next to it, you can clearly see how this brick front has been added on um, to the older building behind. This probably wasn't the viewpoint that the owners were trying to um, show off. But if we go across the road and look back across the building, then this is, this is more like it. This, this is like a stunning Georgian front. Now, most Georgian buildings, as, as we've mentioned earlier, that they're made of brick, Ideally, they are symmetrical, um, but as I said earlier, that's, that's not always possible if you're just putting a brick front on. And this building here, although you can see two door cases, this building originated as one single residence. And the original door was the one on the left. So, all, so in, in that case, it, it wouldn't be symmetrical, but I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment. So what features would you have in a Georgian building? You certainly have sash windows. And you can see all these sash windows here and normally they would consist of 12 panes. Um, above that of course you would have a parapet, you'd have a parapet wall going up two or three feet. The, the, there's a couple of reasons for a parapet. The, the main reason was that they were required to do so. Following the Great Fire of London in 1666 there were various um, building acts, particularly in London and, and the Westminster area, um, which although they didn't apply to Colchester at that time, um, they did in some parts. And the, the idea was to prevent, if the building caught on fire, to protect the fire in some small way to reaching the roof timbers. But of course, to these Georgian owners who were building these houses, the, I think they wanted it because it looked nice. For, for one thing, it hid away the roof and perhaps some little dormer windows, you know, perhaps where the servants lived. Um, and it had a more pleasing appearance. But anyway, let's, um, let's move on. Now with these Georgian buildings, I mean, the Georgian period was quite long from about 1714 to about 1830. And um, it's sometimes difficult to know how old these buildings are. If you can get hold of the deeds, obviously that's a lot easier. But if not, there are one or two features in the building that can give you a very good idea whether it's gonna be an early Georgian or a late Georgian. And um, how you would do that is by looking at the windows. That's a very good clue. And I'm going to show you on this slide here. If you look at the image on the right first, 
So it shows you a, a Georgian window, sash window, but notice around the outside of the panes of glass, you've got this th rather thick white bordered area. That's called the sash box. And within that sash box are the cords that make the window open and close. So you can see that on early Georgian buildings. In the London area from 1709, that was prohibited. They had to be set back a full four inches. But in Colchester and places outside of London, that didn't happen straight away. But we can certainly say it's an early style. And also, if you look at the left hand view, you'll see that the sash windows are fitted almost flush with the front of the building. That is a sign of early Georgian because what happened next, they had to push the frames back about four inches and eventually the sash boxes disappeared altogether to inside the building behind these walls here. Now, if you look at these three examples, you'll see what I mean. And I've tried to put some like early, early to mid and late Georgian descriptions on there. But the one on the left, the one we've just been looking at is, is early Georgian. So that's going to be from about 1714. It might be up to about 1725, but no later than 1740-ish. And you can see the, the, the frame is almost flush with the brickwork, and you can clearly see the sash boxes. The one in the middle, which is actually taken from the building over the road um, from this building, it's, a, it's now a Thai restaurant. And although it's been rendered, you can see that the sash window has been pushed back into the wall so it it's left a reveal here of about four inches but also notice the sash boxes are still visible so this was um this is like an early to mid georgian they've pushed the window frames back but they still haven't got rid of the sash boxes and then we come to the right hand image this is late georgian this is how it became for all buildings eventually um the 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 window frame is pushed back four inches and the sash boxes have completely gone you can't see any sash boxes they are actually behind the wall on the inside now just to show you an example from a building you're very familiar with this is this is now the Prezzo restaurant building on the corner of um, Culver Street and Queen Street and you can see it's two buildings here joined together this one this part here on the right which goes around the corner into Culver Street is a much earlier building you can see the frames are flush with the brickwork and you can see the sash boxes quite clearly. The building on the left is much earlier. You can see here the window frames have been sunk back and the sash boxes have gone. So just a little tip, just by looking at the window frames, you can walk around and look at these buildings and you can get some idea whether they're early Georgian, mid Georgian or perhaps late Georgian. Let's go back to our our building here that we're talking about, which is now numbers 9 and 10 East Hill. As I said, it was originally a single dwelling um, owned by Nathaniel Lawrence or the Lawrence family. But what do we know about the Lawrence family? Well, we could start with Thomas. Thomas Lawrence, um, we know, was mayor of Colchester. We're not sure whether he lived in this building. He may have done, but he was a clothier. These people were bay makers, bay manufacturers. Thomas and both of his sons and Nathaniel Lawrence's we're going to talk about. You know, it wasn't just well-born, well-bred people who made up this genteel class, if you like, this polite society. Many individuals, merchants, bay makers, had made their fortunes in the bay trade in the previous century. They'd become very, very wealthy. They were now styling themselves also as gentlemen, and they were diversifying, they were buying property, and they were definitely part of this um, genteel class um, of the Georgian period. But Thomas Lawrence had a son, Nathaniel. Let's just talk about him. This Nathaniel at the top here, we'll call him Daniel Lawrence Esquire Elder. He was born 1627 and he died in 1714. Now, if you just think about that for a moment, he lived through the siege of Colchester. He would have lived through the Great Plague and seen lots of things. Um, you'll see beneath that he was mayor of Colchester on four occasions. He was a member of parliament for Colchester in 1685 and he was leader of the Puritan party for 50 years. Now, according to his will, and wills are excellent documents for finding out about what people owned. We know that he, he owned property all over Colchester, lots of fields and meadows and property. 
and it also owned, as it says on the right here, East Mill. And he also owned at least, or a share or full ownership of at least six ships at Ipswich. And in his will, he left all these portions of these ships to his granddaughters. But he left his house and the business to his son. You'll see down the bottom here, Nathaniel Lawrence Esquire, the younger. And he was born in 1661 and he died in 1751. So he too lived through the plague as a young child. Um, he didn't have any heirs himself, but he left the property, as we'll see in a moment, and you can see there, to his sister Bridget. He too, interestingly enough, was like his father, he was mayor of Colchester also on four occasions. Uh, he's also a trustee of the Wednesday's Almshouses, who we'll, we'll have a look at later. And um, Philip Moran notes something interesting here in his history of Colchester in 1748. At that time, Nathaniel Lawrence was 88 years old. And Moran says, after having been lame for more than seven years, he suddenly recovered the use of his legs. That's a, an interesting touch. And I've also put on here, the brick front was probably added about 1715. It's definitely early Georgian. And if you look at the date of death, once again, of Nathaniel Lawrence, the elder, he died in 1714. Now, you know, there is a strong supposition that when new people, new owners, moved into a property at this period, they renovated, rebuilt, or remodeled. It, it's happened so many times, and it could be that when Nathaniel Lawrence the Elder died in 1714 and his son inherits, within a short period, he may have decided to put that brick front on. We don't know for sure, but it certainly fits, and um, that's what normally would happen. So this is um, a sale, or a notice rather, of the death of Mrs. Bridget Lawrence. She was the sister, as I said earlier, Nathaniel, and she died in September 1775. But it does give a further clue about Nathaniel. Look, it says, sister to Nathaniel Lawrence Esquire, formerly an eminent Bayes manufacturer of Colchester. So he was a, a wealthy and important individual. And this was the last of the family. The, the, you'll see that the rest of the estate then passed to someone in Lincolnshire. But the house itself, which is still one building, don't forget, one residence, was acquired, you see down the bottom, by James Boggus. Now, James Boggus was one of the Boggus family, we'll speak about later. They were also bay makers, bay manufacturers, who'd become very wealthy. And um, he later sold it to his brother Isaac in 1782. And Isaac continued to live there until he died in 1801. The property then passed to his son, Isaac Rolf Boggus, and they tried to sell it then. They, it was put up for auction in 1801 and it didn't sell and it was put up for auction again in 1809 and here is an advert of the sale in July 1809 and apparently it still didn't sell. I'm not going to try and read all this now but we, we could just look at the top little bit here. It says freehold commodious mansion house. They called their houses mansions. Quite often they would describe them as a capital mansion with sashes. I mean, that's really important. And it says there was offices, pleasure grounds, gardens, and about four acres of land. And it goes on to describe further down um, the description of the property. So, as I said earlier, the, this is the house. It was divided, so they, they couldn't sell it. In 1810, it was divided into two lots and it was sold. They divided it right down the center of the house here, right down the middle of the hall. There was quite a large hall inside. And the one on the left, you can see it became number 10, East Hill, and the one on the right became number nine. And um, if we just, one other feature that um, I probably didn't mention, apart from having sash windows and parapets, most Georgian buildings also had an elegant door case and it often contained classical features. And if we look at these door cases, now the one on the right, of course, is a one that's been added. You can see that originally there was a window arch there, and we'll, we'll leave that one aside. That's not very interesting, but the, the main door was this one on the left with a segmental pediment at the top. And this is what style is called Roman Doric. And Roman Doric in, in particular can be identified by these vertical grooves, there's three of them running in 
little gaps along here, along what's called the frieze. Um, and you only find these, these are called triglyphs. You only find them in Doric architecture. You can find them in Greek Doric or Roman Doric, but these are, are Roman Doric. So that's building number one. We're now gonna move on to building number two. And we're just gonna cross the road and walk up the hill a little bit further. This is a very familiar building to everybody. Um, many people will know this, of course, as Greyfriars College, the, the further uh, adult education center. Um, in previous years, it had been part of the Girls County High School as well. And of course, in modern times, it's now the, the Greyfriars Hotel. So it's still, still in use. The original part of the building is, is this little bit in the center here. So that's the little bit in the middle. And these two big side extensions, one on this side and one on the other side, were added in about 1904. And at that time, a group of French nuns came to Colchester. They acquired the old Greyfriars house and some land either side. And um, they, they put these extensions up and they formed a convent and a school here. And if you look just from this angle, you'll see these lovely decorative bands on the original house. When they added these extensions, look, they continued these features, you can see them quite clearly, running along into the extensions. And I believe that now, since this has been renovated, um, these bands on the extensions have been spruced up a bit, so they look nice and white and creamy like, like they do on the original part there. But we're going to talk a little bit about the centre, the, the main part of the building. And this was built by the Reverend John Halls of Eastthorpe. Now, John Halls was rector of Eastthorpe for 60 years, um, quite a long time. But he, he never lived in Eastthorpe. He was one of these absentee vicars, if you like, and he lived for, for most of the time um, in Fordham. But in 1747, he married Elizabeth Selly, and he landed on his feet. Elizabeth Sally was the daughter of a very rich woman in Colchester, um, also named Elizabeth. She was the, the mother was the, the widow, if you like, of John Sally, who was a very prominent brewer in the town. But she wasn't just a widow, she, she ran the business. When her husband died, she had full control of the business. Her son later died as well, so she ran it on her own. She ran the brewery. Um, she ran coal yards at the Hythe. She had property and houses all over Colchester and beyond. She would grant mortgages to people, lend money. I, she was probably one of the wealthiest women in Colchester at the time. And when she died, much of her estate was settled upon her daughter, Elizabeth, who had married the Reverend John Halls. And the will stipulated that she was to enjoy uh, this bequest, if you like, independently of her husband, um, John Halls. But anyway, they married in 1747, and um, for a while they lived in Trinity House, which is another very large house, um, which is on James Dean's map that we saw at the beginning. It was still on the corner of Trinity Street and Culver Street, owned by the Crefield family for a long time. But um, they eventually moved into this house. They had this built and it, they built it about 1755. Lovely Georgian building, symmetrical. One of the, the things you notice straight away are these double bays. There's a bay on this side and that side of the door and they run right through the ground floor, first floor and right up through the parapet. So that, that's quite interesting. These are called cantered bays. And um, Along here, running across below the parapet, all the way along here, this is, a, this is what they call the cornice. And the cornice, many of these cornices have these um, ornate little brackets inside them. They're not dentil. Dentils are something different, uh, smaller and more oblong. But these, are, these little brackets are called medillions. So this is called a medillioned cornice. And this cornice runs all the way along the top and also that goes up through the pediment here, these little medallions, and it's very strong. So you would probably describe this cornice as a heavy medallioned cornice. Um, you then got the door at the bottom. I'll come back to the door. Above the door, which you often get in Georgian buildings, you have this shape of window. It's a tripartite window. The centre always has an arch, and either side are flat tops. 
And this is known as a Venetian window, or sometimes they're called a Palladian window, typically Georgian. But let's, let's just move on to the door. Also, um, many of these doors, including the one we looked at earlier, they usually have steps going up to them. And that is often done to allow light to come into some of the basement areas. Um, and you can see many basement areas on many of these buildings. But let's look a bit more closely at the door. So you've got the steps going up. You've got a pediment with these little, med little medallions as well. But this is not Roman Doric. This is what you call Ionic. So these capitals uh, above these columns here have these little scrolls. Now, I put at the bottom here, Ionic door case, very suitable for the home of a clergyman. But why would I say that? Well, let me show you this man here. This is Sebastiano Serio. Now, he was a very prominent Italian architect in Italy at the time of the Renaissance. And he was the first person to ever completely illustrate all the classical orders. And not only did he illustrate the classical orders, but he also, um, in his opinion, suggested um, how they should be used. For example, if you were using um, the Doric order, that would be very fitting for maybe the house of a merchant. But he said, if you're using Ionic, which we've got here, he said this would be very suitable for a man of learning. They were his words. So when you think about it, the Reverend John Halls was a man of learning, wasn't he? So it kind of fits. He should have an Ionic door case. I'm sure you've all been to the British Museum at some time. And if you do go there, you can't fail to miss these large Doric columns with the capitals, the typically Doric cap, um, Ionic capitals. And of course, what is the British Museum? It's a place of learning. So when you, when you build a house and you decide on putting a classical porch or door case on, it wasn't just what you, you know, on your whim, what you would have. Um, ideally, it should be reflected on your status or, or what the building was going to be used for. Um, here I, I've, I've have got a sale um, advert for the sale of the estate um, later on in August 13. But th these are really good resources. Now I'm not going to try and read from this, but I, I have picked a couple of bits. I think we'll just read these out because you get so much information. And it says at the top, look, the Priory, formerly part of the Greyfriars Monastery, a very eligible freehold estate, a capital and spacious family mansion situated on a fine commanding eminence at the top of East Hill, the most preferential part of Colchester. The house is a substantial brick edifice with a double bowed front and contains on the grand story a neat entrance hall, library, drawing room, breakfast room, capital dining parlour, seven airy bed chambers on the first story and four good chambers on the upper story. And down the bottom, it speaks about what's outside. Look, lawns, pleasure grounds, fish ponds, a capital kitchen garden, partly walled, with well-stocked fruit trees, another garden completely walled round, dry gravel walks. Remember St Mary's walks at the beginning? A productive orchard, farmyard and outbuildings. And it says at the end, look, a most desirable residence for a gentleman's family. Yes, it says here, this, this was originally part of the site of Greyfriars Monastery. Uh, they were also known as the Friars Minor. And that their monastery was uh, established here sometime in the 14th century. I, I've, um, during my researches, I've, I've looked at lots of pre-Reformation wills in Colchester, and you find lots of people often leaving money to the Friars Minor of Colchester, the Great Friars, uh, to sing masses for their departed souls and the departed souls of their family. And this was all part of the purgatory belief at the time. Anyway, that's number two. We're going to move on to um, building number three. Um, let's just go. I went backwards there. Sorry. So this is our next property. Again, this is literally just over the other side of the road. And this is East Hill House. Um, this was built uh, about 1715, 1720. Certainly the bottom bit, the brick part, and you'll see it's early Georgian. The windows are flush with the brickwork. Um, you'll notice above the windows, 
these are these are called arches they're called brick arches and brick arches can be either segmental which these are they're slightly segmental which is another indicator of an early georgian building because later on they became flat and although they were flat they were still called arches so you'd call it a flat arch believe it or not um, and this top so this was early this bit here the top story was added probably around 1742 something like that the building was owned by george wegg and there's two george weggs there's george wegg the father and george wegg the son so we've got george wegg number one george wegg number two and uh, again this is a roman doric door case it's very similar to the one at nine and ten east hill it's got a segmental pediment at the top we can see the doric design the triglyphs but what they've also added on this one in between the triglyphs where on um, some of the great greek temples they had the marbles think of the elgin marbles with these decorations but what they've got here is little flower motifs and also in these two center ones here bucrania which are ox skulls and the ox skull was a, a very dominant roman feature and it it's depicted in lots of roman buildings so this is um, very typical of roman doric door cases interestingly sometimes you if you read some architectural books you'll find that these are described as tuscan um, which is unfortunate because they're clearly roman doric let's have a look at who built it now if you look at the very top highlighted there we've got um, the grandfather if you like he was also called george wegg and George Wegg, he married Elizabeth Hill, actually in Norwich, in 1663. And they, they were a farming family. And they had all these children, and many of the children became farmers. They weren't particularly wealthy. I suppose they, they had a fair bit of land, but they, you wouldn't call them particularly wealthy. You'll notice some of the children underneath. We've got Charles, Elizabeth, John, Edmund, Robert, Ann, and George. Now, this is our George. This is, we call him George I. He was the one who built East Hill House. He was born in 1665 and he died in 1747. And he was, he's been described as a merchant tailor. So the family wasn't particularly wealthy, but this George became very wealthy and he came to Colchester. We don't know why he came to Colchester and we don't really know how he became so wealthy. Down here, I've um, a few more facts about George Wegg. We know that he acquired substantial shares in the Hudson Bay Company. And he held a number of large estates along the coast of Essex, Clacton, Jaywick, Mersey, Ashwardham, and Denji. So quite a wealthy individual. And we know that he married three times. So he married Sarah Smith in 1697, Elizabeth, we're not sure of the date, and Anna Maria Kelper in 1712-1713. That was his third wife. Between these three wives, he had 12 children, but only two survived. One son from this marriage and one son from that marriage. And, you know, it wasn't just the poorer families that suffered this infant mortality. You know, he lost 10 of his 12 children. Many of the poor people did, but, you know, this, this didn't matter about what status you were nobody understood about microbiology or the the niceties of hygiene in those days and um this particular period we're looking at the certainly the earlier 18th century was really the high point of infant mortality it only slowly got better and better from that point so this was really a bad period but what else do we know about george wegg who built the house well a few facts here we know that at the time of his first marriage he was living in colchester and that was in 1697 actually living in somewhere in st buttles parish he also we know became a large shareholder in the hudson's bay company also in 1697 now that's interesting is it possible that he gained some wealth through marriage we know certainly the first marriage and the last one, at least, we know they were very wealthy families. Could it be that when he married, that the family settled a large sum of money on the marriage? Is that where he got the money to invest, to build the house perhaps, and to buy these shares? We don't know, but that's a thought. 
He was certainly regarded as one of the wealthiest inhabitants of Colchester. And in 1728, he was able to lend the corporation £2,400 to pay off their debts. And in the same year, he was made an alderman. And he was styled or known as George Wegg Esquire of Colchester. Um, Philip Morant called him that. He was very much part of this political and social elite. He was um, certainly a, a member, part of the town's literary and musical circle um, and walked in you know, really the highest circles. In some of the early town plans of Colchester, he's one of only about two people who actually have their name on the map. Charles Gray was one, George Wegg was the other. But the question remains right at the bottom look, how did he gain his substantial wealth? Well, I'd just like to throw something in the mix, if I may. In 1877, a man called Joseph Yellowy Watson published this book, The Tendering Hundred in the Olden Time. And in, in this book, he talks about J. Wick Clacton, where we know that Wick had estates. This is what he said, look. If we look at the top bit first, it says J. Wick formerly belonged to the Lords Darcy as part of the manor, but was purchased by Captain Wick, from whom it descended to the rounds who now own it. Now we know that the Round family did eventually inherit certainly all the Colchester estate belonging to George Wigg. They didn't actually inherit the J Wigg, but that doesn't really matter. And then down here it says, the name of Wegg reminds us that in the olden times, smuggling was carried on to a great extent at Clacton and along the coast. Even so recently as 50 years ago, we remember tales were told of daring runs and hairbreadth escapes of these jolly smugglers. Now go down here, look. At Clacton, Captain Wegg, a retired sea skipper, was said to have made enough money by smuggling to build a substantial house and to buy Jaywick Farm of several hundred acres. Now that's the thought, isn't it? We know that our George Wegg owned Jaywick Farm. What he's insinuating here, that he got rich because he was a smuggler. Now, a few years after this book was published, in the 18 sort of 80s, there was a lot of correspondence in the Essex County Standard about this book and about this assumption or, or accusation, if you like, that George Wegg was a smuggler. And of course, the Round family were, were horrified. You know, this was putting a great slur on their family, and there were a lot of arguments going forth and correspondence. And in the end, the paper had to stop any further correspondence because it was sort of getting out of hand. It's just a thought. We don't really know. But I've just added the two boys now onto this picture. So George Wegg, we'll call him the second. Here he is. He's the one who built East Hill House. He was a gentleman. In fact, they were all gentlemen. And an ecclesiastical lawyer. He married Hannah Crefield. Crefield family is very important in this. Whose daughter Tamar had married James Round. And whose daughter Susan Round was his heir. And on the other side, Samuel, his brother, he was also a gentleman and lawyer. And when the elder George died, he left East Hill House to his son, George, but he left his shares in the Hudson Bay Company to his son, Samuel, who eventually acquired them all. And um, it must have been quite a substantial um, value because later on, look, he became the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company. And um, he served there for a number of years. This is the rear of the property. This is what is called the garden front. And um, the garden front, um, if we look back at um, Philip Morant's map or James Dean's map, which appears in Philip Morant's history, we can see here there's East Hill House. And this is his, his large garden. I'm going to make that a bit bigger for you so you can fully appreciate it. The Roman wall runs all the way around here. And this was effectively his garden fence at the back of his house. Philip Morant tells us that in the 1740s, when George, the younger George, um, he started making improvements to the house. That's probably when he put the top story on. And Philip Morant tells us that he, he actually purchased nine tenements, which were nearby, and pulled them down so he could make his garden that much better. And not only that, but this part of land which goes down to the Roman wall was known as Berryfield. 
and there was a traditional fair like a horse fair that was held on Berryfield every year and people had access to it and down Queen Street here all the properties down here they had access through their back gardens onto Berryfield now of course George Wade doesn't like this so what he did in the 1760s he acquired the freeholds of 13 of these properties he then resold them or re-let them back to them having first sealed up the entrance at the back so they didn't have the access you know you must have had a lot of money to be able to buy up these nine and knock them down and then buy up all these just to close off the access at the back of course one thing that he couldn't buy up was st james church he, he had to make do with that in the corner of his property but even so his garden extended to nearly nine acres not bad for a house within Colchester. Now, all 18th century gentlemen aspired to having, we spoke about the walks, didn't we, at St Mary's, the walks around the church. We know over at Greyfriars he had walks. You know, every, if you could aspire to it, you wanted your own walks, or what they call a terrace. And George Wegg had his own terrace, and you can see it pictured along here. At one end of the terrace is a large sort of monument or obelisk type thing and you along the terrace then there's a little summer house what would happen you can imagine him inviting his guests over for dinner and they would then come out of the garden front in their refinery to have a little stroll or promenade walk along his garden and you can imagine them walking along his terrace here and you know they might walk two or three hundred yards however long it is when they get to the end they want to rest themselves so always have a little summer house and that's where they would rest and then they would you know perhaps go back and go up and down a few times admiring all the flower borders and what have you now this um this terrace um this little summer house rather of course is no longer part of east hill house it's now in this can be seen in the minories garden and the reason for that is that the owners of the minories in 1723 the Ben Susan Butt family acquired some of the garden from East Hill House to enlarge their garden, and it included the little summer house. And of course, you'll all know that in about 1960, they drove a big road right through between the two buildings anyway when they built the bus station, which further made it um, completely separated. If we look on a, an ordnance survey from 1897, again, we can still see if you see the terrace. We can see the summer house. You can even see some little steps running down off the terrace into this flower border area. And I believe here there might even be a little water feature. Now, when I took this photograph just a, not a few years ago, you can see that, well, first of all, you can see the steps are still there and they are still there today. So we hope they don't ever knock them down. They keep them there. But the, the terrace was being used as a car park, as you can see here. And if we go on top of the terrace, that's where you would parade along. It would probably have been a gravel walk at that time. And you can see the summer house in the background, but of course you can't actually access it because the road runs through, which now goes to first sight. And this is a quite an interesting aerial view of the first site building almost finished, but you can see the extent um, there's St. James church. All of this was, Wegg's garden and you can see East Hill House here, um, there's Greyfriars we saw earlier. Building number four we're going to look at now, we're going to come out of this road here and just over the road here is our next building that we're going to look at and this is called Winsley's House. In fact there's a little plaque on the wall there that actually says the same thing and this was owned from 1719 up until 1726-27 by Arthur Winsley. Now Arthur Winsley was another prosperous bay maker, made a lot of money in the bay trade and um, he later of course like others styled himself as a gentleman and um, you'll know that um, his name lives on in Winsley's almshouses which are at Old Heath which we'll talk about in just a short while. But um, just talking about this um, property just for a moment the, the building, as, as we can see it here, was actually purchased in 1705 by James Dean. Now, not James Dean, 
who created the map for Philip Morant, but his father. In 1705, his father, James Dean, bought this property for £120. And just three years later, in 1708, he sold it for £350. You know, almost trebling his investment. And it was said that he had lately repaired and beautified it. Now, I don't know what it was like before he, he bought it, but this is how he had beautified it. He didn't beautify it, of course, by putting a lovely brick front on like other people were doing and putting a parapet, a nice classical door case. Maybe because of all these chimneys over the place and the carriageway to contend with, maybe he didn't think it was worth trying to create, um, you know, a nice Georgian front with symmetry and what have you. But he has put these interesting um, sort of gothic head type panes here and they've all got these nice square wood, ho wood um, hood mouldings over the windows. But anyway, this is the building that Arthur Winsley moved into in 1719. Now, as I said, he died January 1726, 27, depends which calendar you're using at the time. And he left some interesting bequests. And um, we're just going to look at a couple of them. Now, the first one, um, he left £500, a lot of money, a lot of money in that time, for the Brickhouse Farm, which is up where Winsley's Arms House, which was located in the old Heath area of the town, to be converted into 12 convenient apartments for the habitation of 12 ancient men. And that's basically what happened. So, and these ancient men, so they'd, they'd have these 12 apartments. They were to be probably ancient men who'd fallen upon hard times, maybe tradesmen of the town. They were also to, they were all to be male, by the way, and they were all to receive two and six a week each. And once a year, they were to be given a cauldron of coal. It's equivalent of like about 2,500 weight of coal. And if they happened to be married, when they died, their widows had to move out. Now, I know that sounds a little bit harsh, but that was part of the deal. Now, later on, you, you'll be aware of Kendall's Almshouses, which are located further down Military Road. Um, when people moved into Kendall's Almshouses, they gave priority to the widows who'd been forced to move out of Arthur Winsley's houses. But anyway, he, another bequest he made was this one underneath. He also left £250 to be laid out on a monumental statue of himself, um, which was to be erected in St. James Church. His will states, I give £250 to be laid out on the men a monument to be erected against the south wall of the said church with my statue cut out in marble, lying with the left hand under the head and a book in the right hand and in a nightgown with inscriptions as my most judicial friends shall think fit and proper so that again is quite um extensive amount of money well let's look first have a look at Winsley's arms houses as they might have appeared this is an early drawing they opened in 1780 1734 and you can see this there's, there's 12 units here the center part is actually a chapel because this was built quite away from the town and probably it was thought that these elderly gentlemen wouldn't be able to walk all the way to church in town. So they had their own chapel and the clergyman would come along and uh, do a service for them on their own property. But it's still there. This, these original apartments are still there built into the larger complex at Winsley's today. So this is where the chapel is. And although there were originally 12 almshouses today, there are about 80 or so apartments including the original 12 but other bungalows houses that go with them let's just go back to st james church because this is interesting he asked for his statue to be placed on the south wall of st james church this is interesting because he wasn't even an anglican he was a nonconformist and he used to attend a nonconformist church in what is now priory street which was a precursor to what was built at lion wall but he was mayor of Colchester, Arthur Winsley, on one occasion. Now, to take civic office, you had to be an Anglican. You had to take Holy Communion in an Anglican church. 
before you could be considered for civic office. So it seems that Arthur Winsley became an Anglican for one year during his time he was mayor. And after that, he probably went back to his other church. But his monument, regardless of what his religious persuasion was, ended up in St. James Church. His wife was buried there as well, so maybe that was something to do with it. And here is the monument. It was moved from the South Wall some time ago, and it's now on the right-hand side. As you go in the porch, you can see there, it's on the right-hand side, and it's massive. Um, it's very ornate. It's about 10 feet high and about seven feet across. And although he may well be dressed in his bedclothes, I mean, his hat might be a bed hat, <laughs> But he, he, he's wearing a, a very ornate waistcoat with buttons and what have you. So they may be his own bedclothes, but he certainly, uh, he certainly looks fairly well refined. Now look, go back to Winsley's Almshouse again. I went into this, this is, this is where the chapel used to be. This is now where they have a meeting place for the residents. And when I went in there, You'll notice they've got these various stone plaques scattered around the walls, depicting donations over the years that people have made to keep the places running. But I also glanced over here and almost did a second take because there is an identical statue as we've got in St. James Church. And there they are side by side. The one on the left is the one in St. James Church. That's the, the marble version, the end result. The one on the right, is a smaller version. It's called a maquette. It's like a working model for the sculptor. It's much smaller. It's about five foot by three foot. It's, it's about a fifth of the original size. Both the, the, the working model and the finished model are believed to be the work of Richard Van Spanger. For, he was paid about 350 pounds or so at the time um, to do this, I think. Um, it, it, it worked out quite expensive. But anyway, um, the the model look is 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 quite poor the one on the left is the marble version and the one on the right is terracotta so this was his working model but it's interesting that both have survived until i went in to that um, old chapel area i didn't even know this um second one existed we're now going to move on to building number five of six but before we do that i'd just like to share with you this image of st peter's church um, but, um believed to have been painted about 1780 and it shows in the road here an, an old bay wagon they're loading some bay cloth into a wagon next to that you can see a well this was known as king cole's pump you see somebody with a getting a couple of buckets to go and get some water in fact when the um when workmen were working in in this area in 1966 they actually uncovered that well they dug down, they were laying telecoms cables or something, I believe, and they found the well. It went down well over 50 feet. And when they measured it, it was 10 feet in diameter. So this would probably have been the most important central well in Colchester, which had been free to the, you know, the population. But I want to show you this. This is the old vicarage, St. Peter's Vicarage on the right hand side here. So this has also got a brick front as depicted. I believe this was believed to have been added sometime in the 1770s, but it's quite unusual. You've got a porch, you've got a, a bay, a cantered bay going through the parapet, supported on a columned porch. Does that remind you of anything? Well, what about the minories? It's almost identical. The minories has got a, a double bay rising up, in this case through another story, supported on a column porch exactly the same as that we know this presumably dates the 1770s we know this brick front was added in 1776 almost certainly by the same architect this is a very rare architectural feature in colchester the only other one that is similar is this building in head street which has got a circular double bay supported again on a columned porch but um Let's have a look um, a bit closer at the, at the minories then, the building. Now, first of all, a little bit of information about the, about the owners. Now, it was remodeled by Thomas Boggus, but he was the son of Isaac. Now, Isaac Boggus, um, who was born in 1699, um, his father was a baker on East Hill, and his father 
we don't know his name, but he apprenticed Isaac to a baymaker in 1713. Now, by 1731, he must have done pretty well, because by 1731, not only has established his own bay business, but he's also been able to purchase what the minerals was at that time, although it didn't have the brick front. He was able to purchase that in 1731. Um, he had three children, three sons. He had Thomas, who was the elder, Isaac and James. And we know that by the 1750s, Isaac had made his fortune. And when he died in 1762, um, he gave the house and the main business to his son Thomas, but his other two sons received something, you know, about £6,000 each, which was a small fortune at the time. Um, this, this is a nice view, uh, the one that you often see if you're walking up from the East Hill area. And this actually, you can see this is another example where a brick front has been stuck on the front of a much earlier timber frame building. And many of these old timber frame buildings would have had the, the upper story would have jetted over the ground floor story. And what Thomas did, Thomas Boggus, when he remodeled this in 1776, he's literally superimposed this brick front onto this old timber frame building. Obviously done a lot of work inside as well. But he's also underbuilt here, look. Although there may have been an, an overhang, and the wall might have been set about two foot further back, he's actually grabbed a couple of feet of the pavement all the way along because he's under, made it straight down. And not only that, he's also put a porch on and grabbed another two or three feet of the footpath. They seemed to be able to get away with it in those days. They did have fines if you did do that, but they were so small that it wouldn't have made a difference to someone like, like um, Thomas Boggus. And there's the porch again a Serliano would say um, you know this would be suitable Sebastiano Serlio this would be suitable for a merchant's house and again you can clearly see the the triglyphs which are always prominent in a Roman Doric porch we go to the rear of the property this is the garden front now it's not quite so decorated as, as the front but it um, it does have a Venetian window in the center. Um, it's made up of brick and although there's, there's a few classical features but you also do have these um, these brick coins at the side here um, in sort of long and short work. They look, they look quite attractive but of course it's in the garden of the minories where you have got the summer house that we spoke about earlier that used to be part of George Wake's property. Now, it's believed that this summer house was created about 1745 by James Dean, the man who made the map and who worked for lots of these um, genteel class. Um, you know, they did work for Wegg, he did a lot of work for Charles Gray, um, and he's responsible for this. Now, and it's believed he got his inspiration from this man, a man called Batty Langley who at the time was a, a well-known architect and published lots of designs and drawings. And he also he published a, a, a lot of designs for garden buildings. And um, this was published in 1742. And this particular design is called an octangular umbrella to terminate a view. Now the view, if you think back to George Wegg's terrace, when you're walking along the terrace, you can see if you look into the distance where you're going, that's your view, and the summer house is right at the end, it terminates the view. See, some of these summer houses were put in the center of a terrace, so you could look either way, but this one was to terminate a view. And now it's called an umbrella. In my book, Buildings of Colchester, um, where I've included these pictures, I wrote that down, and when it went off to the publishers, one of the editors there, he must have saw this, or maybe he put on his automatic um, spelling check, I don't know, but he changed umbrella to umbrella. And he probably thought I'd, I'd made a mistake. And I remember having to go back to him and say, look, no, this, can you turn it back again? It, it's umbrella. Um, okay, we're gonna move to our final section now. We're nearly done. This is our final stop, building number six, and we have to include holly trees. 
Holly Tree's house, according to the architectural historian Nicholas Pevsner, who I'm sure you're aware of, in his Essex edition, and when speaking about Colchester, he described this as the best 18th century house in Colchester. It's an early, we know this was built 1718, 1719, so it's early Georgian. And of course, the, the windows are almost flush. Well, no, they're not actually, they're a little bit back. The, the sash boxes can be seen. They've got segmental arches. We've got the parapet. It's symmetrical. It's got everything that you would expect. Just go on to the owner for a moment. It was owned by Charles Gray, 1696 to 1782. And he was um, a very prominent citizen of Colchester. Just like George Wegg, he'd have his name on the map, Charles Gray's house. He was MP for Colchester in five parliaments, a trustee of the British Museum, uh, a justice of the peace for Essex. He was an attorney himself, very successful one. <coughs> And he, he acted as steward at several manors around the area, quite a big landowner, um, antiquarian, all in all a prominent citizen of Colchester. If we just go a bit closer, now this is what I want to show you. Yes, although they've got segmental heads, although you can still see the sash boxes, the actual frames have been sunk back a bit, which was quite unusual in Colchester at this period. Now, I just refer you to the bottom. Remember, the London Building Act of 1709 required window frames to be set back four inches. And at the top here, the builder of holly trees was a London builder, Thomas Blankton. Not only was the builder from London, so was the person who built it, which we'll come on to in a moment. So it all depended. If you had a, a London owner and builder coming to Colchester, they're going to do things the London way. So you have to view every single property um, separately. But generally speaking, the rules that I've said to you would apply in Colchester. Now, I'd like to read this out to you because I think it's important. Who actually built holly trees? It wasn't Charles Gray. So if you just bear with me, we'll go through this. I've got two of these slides like this, but I think it's interesting if I can share them with you. And I'm gonna read them out so I don't make any mistakes. <coughs> so a lady called Elizabeth Cornelson, who was the widow of William Henry Cornelson, built Holly Tree's house in 1718, 1719. She came from Camberwell in London, which is now in London. Now, she died in 1719, so that, you know, she never got to live in the house that she built. And she bequeathed the house, Holly Trees, to her niece, Sarah Crefield, Nee Webster. So there's the, another mention of the Crefield family. Now, Sarah, at the time, was married to Ralph Crefield. Ralph Crefield died in 1723, quite young, at the age of 36. And his widow, Sarah Webster, then married, who became Sarah Crefield, she was Sarah Crefield, she married Charles Gray in 1726. So Holly Trees had been built about eight or so years before Charles Gray moved in. Sarah's mother, Mary Webster, Nee Kersterman, Dutch family again, lots of these were Dutch immigrants. Mary, by the way, was Elizabeth's sister. She later purchased the adjoining castle and its lands from Charles Chamberlain Rebo, who was the grandson of Sir Isaac Rebo, and presented them to her daughter, Sarah and Charles Gray, at the time of their wedding. So what actually happened, she, she acquired the castle from Charles Chamberlain Rebo, who'd come into ownership of it, and she then presented it to the newly married couple because it, it abutted up to the property they already owned. So Charles Gray came to own a castle. This was basically a wedding present. So I don't know what you've got for your wedding, but this is some of the things you might have got if you was pretty wealthy, if you lived in the 18th century. When Charles Gray died in 1782, his life interest in holly trees and the castle came to an end, and the properties reverted to the Crefield family in the form of Tamar Crefield, who was married to James Round. So the Round family gets all of this eventually. If you look at John Pryor's Prospect of Colchester, 
which was completed and published in 1724, although it was a year after Ralph Crefield died, his house seen here, this is the Holly Tree's house we know now, it was Ralph Crefield's house then, and on the list here it says at number five, Esquire Crefield's house. So this is part of the will, I thought this was interesting, of Sir Isaac Rebo's will um, from 1726. This was just before the Greys get married. I just want to highlight a couple of bits. <clears throat> In this top bit he says, I give, devise, bequeath all my singular, the manners, messages, lands, tenements, and hereditaments, whatsoever and wheresoever, in the several counties of Essex, Kent, Suffolk, Middlesex, and elsewhere in England. And then he says, the castle of Colchester only accepted. And he gave all of this, all of these estates everywhere, to his grandson, down the bottom look, Isaac Leeming Rebo but not the castle. He gave the castle to his grandson, Charles Chamberlain Rebo, which you can see here. And why did he give it to Charles Chamberlain Rebo? By reason of the disobedience and undutifulness of my said grandson, Charles, to whom I design to give no part of my estate except the castle of Colchester. So that's how he came to give it. Fortunately for Charles, this was a white elephant, you know, a large expensive to maintain edifice. Luckily for him, as we learned, Mary Webster was on hand to purchase it. He was probably glad to get rid of it. She loved to be able to buy it because she could then give it to her daughter and her husband, Charles Gray, which would fit right next to their property. Um, the Crefield family, I, I need to go through this as well because this explains how the Rand family basically got everything. Ralph Crefield married Sarah Webster in 1711, July. Now, Ralph Crefield's grandfather was George Tastebill, another Dutch immigrant. And Sarah Webber's, Webster's grandmother, Sarah Tastebill, they were brother and sister. They had 11 children, Ralph and Sarah, nine of whom died in childhood. Another example of severe infant mortality, even among the wealthy inhabitants. Only Peter and Hannah survived into adulthood. Peter Crefield had two children, one named Peter, one named Tamar. But by 1748, both Peter the father and Peter his son had died, leaving his nine-year-old daughter Tamar as the heir to the entire estate. Tamar later married James Round of Birch Hall in 1758, and it was thus through the Round family that the castle estate descended. And Hannah, meanwhile, the other survival, she married George Wegg of East Hill House, and as they ended up childless, most of the Wegg estate passed to his heir and goddaughter, Susan Round, who was the eldest daughter of his niece Tamar and James, and thus also to the Round family. So they, that large area of Colchester, which I said about a third of the town belonging to three families, about two thirds of that ended up with the Round family. And they still owned it in the 1920s, when Colchester Borough Council, with the help of Lord Cowdery, were able to buy up all the castle lands and holly trees, and it was presented to the borough. And here we've got a childhood painting of Tamar, later Mrs. James Round. The, here is the garden front of Holly Trees. You'll see the extension by James Dean on the right hand side. It didn't do anything to enhance the symmetry, but that was what they were building at the time. But another final interesting feature to show you, um, if you look close up, is the brickwork on Holly Trees. You'll see this on the front of the building and on the back. And it's quite a rare feature in Colchester and it's called tuck pointing. And if I blow that up a bit, you know, when the Holly Trees was built, even though it was built by London builders, we almost certainly use local bricks, handmade bricks. And if you look closely, these handmade bricks could be all different shapes and sizes with bits out of them and what have you. And that wouldn't look very nice. So if you 
it would cost a lot of money. It would probably double the cost of the brickwork, but you could make it look quite attractive. And how they did it was on the right-hand side here. I'm going to go from top to bottom. So there's the brick. They would mix up the mortar and they would fill it in. But before this mortar dried off, they would rake back about an inch from the face of the building. In those days, they would get, then get some of these red bricks, maybe some old broken ones, and they would crush them up into dust. And then they would mix that, mix that dust with their mortar and keep adding to it to try to get the mortar almost the same colour as the brickwork. And then they would fill in this bit here. You can see where they're filled in with red mortar at various places. Before this mortar di um, dried off, they would get a, a special long metal um, thing which they would push into the mortar to make a little groove, the long parts and the little uprights. And then when this had completely dried off, they would fill this groove, which you can see here, with lime putty. And it all, lime putty always dried brilliant white. And from a distance, it would look pretty smart. Holly Tree's house was never meant to be seen from the sides, either from the back or set back from a little courtyard from the road. And you can see in these little series of pictures, there's a wall that hasn't been made with tuck pointing. Here's some of the process. It's quite involved. You can Google this and find out about this yourself, but it would have added great expense to doing it. But the end result, you can see, you know, from a distance, the brickwork would have looked actually brilliant. And finally, not to be outdone, of course, Charles Gray also wants his terrace. And he had his terrace running along here. Look, there's his house and there is his terrace. And if we just zoom in, so what he did, he had a little stone rotunda, rotunda built here. The part of that still survives, by the way. And then you'd walk up here. He's actually walking, making use of the old Norman embankment to the castle. And planted all these trees and you walk along this terrace and you walk along right to the end. And what is terminating your view? A little summer house. You can still see the same view when you walk along the terrace today. And here is the summer house. There it is. He even gives us the date in his diary of when he did this. He set up the summer house at the west end of the terrace on the 24th of May, 1731. And again, he's used the Roman Doric style. You will often find um, in many books about Colchester, this is described as a little Greek temple. Well, it certainly hasn't got Greek decoration. This is Roman. And just to finish, um, because I've been mentioning this quite a while, this is illustrated here. This is Roman Doric. These are the triglyphs. There's Greek Doric. We do have a couple of examples in Colchester. And when the Greeks did it, they didn't want to leave a funny little bit at the end here. So what they did, although they centered their triglyphs over the columns, and exactly in between the columns, when they got to the edge, if they put it over the column, it wouldn't work out right. So they put it right at what they call the angle. But when the Romans came along, trying to improve upon what the Greeks did, they thought they ought to keep it over the column. So they did, regardless that it left a little gap here. And that's what we can see here. And bear in mind the fact Charles Gray was one of these people who believed when he built, when, the, when he owned the castle, that it was some Roman building of some kind. He didn't necessarily believe it was a Norman castle built with Roman materials. He may have thought it was some big Roman granary or something that had been converted into a castle. So when he was doing his renovations, he thought he was renovating a Roman building, hence and again why he would put a Roman feature. I'm going to finish there. Um, I hope that's been of interest. If you'd like to read more about buildings in Colchester, uh, you can look at my book, Buildings of Colchester, which goes right around the whole town um, discussing things such as we've been doing here. So I'm going to leave it there and thank you very much for listening.